Okay, so as been stated, this morning we are starting our new summer series in the book of Philippians. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. New Testament, and it is familiar, hopefully, to all of us. Uh, I've heard from a number of you saying, this is my absolute most favorite book of the Bible. And it is quoted a lot. There's these phrases that are powerful, impactful, and beneficial. Not that the rest of the Bible is not. They are as well. But there are these um, truths that we can gravitate to and grab onto. And this is a good thing. So over the summer, over this next three months, we're going to be walking through this book. And my hope is that the Lord will be speaking to you. Now, I know he's going to be speaking to you, so the other side of the coin is, my hope is that you will be listening, right? So may God give us ears to hear what he is speaking to our church, what he is speaking to us as an individual. And so I know that there's lots of information, right? And I know that you get notes and like, there's a lot of stuff here. I know that. And I don't expect you to um, know it all, nor memorize it. But what I want you to do is to understand, and I want you to remember something. I want you to remember a thing. I want something to impact you today. This is why we trust the Holy Spirit. This is why we pray, God, you have to be working among us. Because if you're not, all it is is talking heads and songs. However, we know as we prayed, and God promises that he will be with us and moving among us and help us in our learning, in our growing, in our connecting, in our understanding. And so he does that in our relationship with him and the application that we have with each other. And so the book of Philippians, as been mentioned, was written by a guy named Paul. He was in prison. He was a missionary spreading the gospel. And God empowered, called and equipped him to write these letters. And these letters were much more than letters because it was to a specific church, but it was to the church. It was to a specific people, but it was to all people. And we recognize this as the very word of God. So I can talk a whole bunch about this book, but I have something even better than that. It is a video. So you say, a video, Dave? Yes, a video. Now, I did an experiment on the book of Habakkuk with this group that's called the Bible Project. If you have not heard about the Bible Project, I would highly recommend them. Just Google it, look for it. You'll find it. And they have background videos. They have all types of stuff on certain subjects. Really solid material. And there's stuff, by the way, and in the notes, you'll see if you flip over the back of the notes, you'll see this diagram, this cartoony looking thing. He's going to walk through that. I hope that this video is helpful to you. Now, when we played Habakkuk, all I heard was positive things. <laughs> a lot of positive things. Like, hey, maybe we should watch a video every week. No, no one did say that. <laughs> No, I didn't say that. (laughs) But uh, it just helps us to kind of get an understanding so we can understand how this book fits together and where it fits in the bigger uh, context and the bigger canon. So it helps us to really understand it well. And so we are going to watch that video. I say, wow, I really like that video. I want to see it again. Go over to Bible Project. Go over to our Crosspoint Connection. We have a link there. You can look at it again and hopefully explore some other things. So we're going to take about nine minutes or so. We're going to watch this video and the notes are on the back and just look to take it in to understand and then we'll jump into our passage for this morning. So go ahead, hit that video. Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution, but they remained a vibrant community 
faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no picnic, but it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad, because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians, and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up the same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism. But their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution. But they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1 through 3, and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all, and even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. 
So Timothy is like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. Paul's point here is that these are the kinds of people who are living, breathing examples of the story of Jesus, and they are worthy of invitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven, which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrifice official gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment. It's simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal, transforming encounter. And that's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. Okay. I'm glad you liked it. Those are helpful, and hopefully now you have a better understanding of what this book is. And again, this summer we're going to go through it section by section and do some deeper dives into these things, so hopefully we'll understand it, we'll apply it to our lives. So again, if you have a Bible, go ahead, open up Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to look to go over the first 11, um, <laughs> 11 chapters, no, that's not true, the 11 verses, there's not 11 chapters, the first 11 verses as we take a look at what is written um, for us and absorb it. Okay, so this is um, our overarching theme for our series is living as citizens of heaven. So Paul is addressing the church again, addressing us as to what it means to live as now a citizen of heaven and how we are to do this practically with one another. So there are truths to hang on to and apply. So here we are, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. My first point is this, and all of these are actionable, is receive grace from God 
and peace with God. So we are to receive peace, or excuse me, receive grace from God and receive peace from God. So here we are, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully you're aware of who Paul is. He often traveled with other people, in this case, a young man named Timothy who became a pastor in the church of Ephesus. They together were writing, being um, inspired and um, um, inspired and <laughs> given words to say by the Holy Spirit. And I like how they describe themselves. They call themselves servants of Jesus Christ. That is a high and lofty title. Now, in our society, being a servant is something that we don't say, oh, I'm a servant. This is my highest ambition. In actuality, in Christianity, being in service to the king of kings is the highest position that we can have. Not only do we serve Jesus Christ, but we're a son-like. He is our big brother, and we are children of God. These are titles we are given when we are born again by the Spirit of God. That is incredible. Paul recognized that his life wasn't his own. A servant's role is to serve the one that they are connected to. And so he first and foremost recognized that his identity is being a servant of Jesus Christ. Do you think of yourself that way? Because this title wasn't just reserved for Paul or for pastors like Timothy. It's reserved for us as children of God. We have a higher calling than your vocation, right? Or what God has called you to say specifically, this is your application, but your highest call is to be a servant of Jesus Christ, which means you get up in the morning. Good morning, Lord. I am here today to honor you, to please you, to do your will. Try that. Try that tomorrow. Employ this mindset. Believe me, your day will go differently. Now, it doesn't mean that God's going to supernatural, you know, part the traffic, right? <laughs> or supernaturally make your boss okay with you, or supernaturally give you a download of all the stuff. Off. I'm not saying that, but you will change in your orientation towards whatever is going to happen that day. So please view yourself like this. And he says some more things about us, but if we got up in the morning, hello, Lord, I'm here to serve you today, to honor you today, to please you today. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for helping me. And God, may you take this day and may my love for you be shown in my service with you and for you and because of you and through you. I love this greeting. And Paul does this all over the place. He has lots of other titles, but he says, my first and foremost ambition is a servant of Jesus Christ. And he says, now, this is to all gods, I like this, holy people. You and I are called together, okay? This is plural, holy people, plural. We together, the church, are called holy. Now, how do we become holy? Is it something that we are to strive towards? Now, it's a trick question, right? It's a yes and no. Number one, it's no because there was only one holy person, and it's not you, okay? 
only one who is good. His name is Jesus the Christ, who could have walked back into heaven on his own merit because he was perfect, one who is holy. And so in Adam, all die. This is Adam and Eve. We, they were representative of humanity. When he sinned, we all sinned. Scripture says that Jesus is the second Adam. And in Jesus Christ, we all are made holy because he is holy and we are in him. And he applies that holiness to us. That's really good news, right? And so we are called and made holy in Christ. And therefore, we live out of that holiness, holiness. Not to be holy, but because we are holy. And so we now are sanctified, made like Christ, to walk according to the nature that God has given us. It's Galatians chapter 5. Look it up. You, my friends, are eternal people. You are a holy person if you are in the holy person, right? Jesus Christ. He calls us holy. And how does this happen? Well, you are all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, which is the place at Rockford, which is a place, and God has given us leaders to help us to oversee, to serve us. In verse 2, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. We all need grace, and we can say amen. Grace, we know ourselves. I need grace, and God extends us this grace. And because of his grace, we have peace, right? Namely, number one, with God. And namely, we can be also at peace internally, and we can be at peace horizontally with other people. All of us long for peace, I know this about you because you're a human, as I am a human. God extends grace to us so that we can be at peace. Right? Just let's take a collective deep breath. Ready? Here we go. Grace to you. Peace you. God is for you. You, Your eternal destiny is secured in Christ. God has given his Holy Spirit to help you. And y'all, we need some help. Internally. Externally. I love this about most of Paul's letters. He says grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's incredible. And I want our identity to be in Christ. If you're going to have pride about any identity, make sure it's because it's in Jesus Christ. He's made us holy. He's put us at peace. He brings us Together, he gives us eternity. Even in these opening verses, in this greeting, there's so much for us. God, thank you for allowing us to know you. God, thank you for allowing us to serve you. God, thank you for giving us your grace. God, thank you for giving us your peace. This is incredible. This is our identity. So I said receive grace from God. How do you do that? You open your hands and you open your heart. God, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe what you say about me. I believe these things. I receive them through your spirit. This isn't a striving. This isn't a earning, right? When you give your kids a birthday present, you say, well, you've earned this this year. No, I'm giving this to you because I love you out of 
the grace I have for you. All the child does is open their hands and open their hearts and says, thank you. So all I'm asking you to do is to receive these good gifts from God, a new identity and grace and peace and an opportunity to know him and to serve him. Second, as we continue, this is the second main point. First, we're to receive grace from God and peace with God. Second, we are to be confident of God's work, okay, this is intentional wordage, in and through you. Be confident that God is working in you and God is working through you. Okay, this is starting with verse 3. Let's continue. Now, Paul says through the Holy Spirit, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I love this about Paul. Paul was not begrudgingly doing his ministry out of obligation. Right? He actually loved people. Right? You want your leaders to love you. And guess what? I love you. <laughs> I do. We do. It's a joy to be here. We were away from here. We missed y'all. I mean it. Did we pray for y'all? Absolutely. Why? Because I'm the pastor and I'm supposed to. <laughs> or a pastor. No. I know your names. No, what's going on? Most of your names. I don't know all your names. Sorry, I'm learning, okay? No, a lot of stories. Spent a lot of time. It's a joy, right? We live from our blood, away from our blood family, right? We have a spiritual family Amen. that's by the blood of Christ, greater than any DNA, right? Amen. We're family. We're a big family, but we're family, right? Let's think that way about each other. And Paul says, hey, when I pray for you, and hopefully you're praying for the people sitting in your pew. Hopefully you're praying for people who are sitting next to you. When I pray for you, I do this in joy. Well, why? Because of your partnership in the gospel. Do you know that we in this room are partners in the gospel, now, how does that happen? Well, we partner together every time you put in some money into the offering place. That is a partnership, right? We partner together every time that you sit in this place and you sing something, right? We're singing to God and we're also encouraging each other. When I hear your voice, when I see your face, when I, I, I feel your handshake or your hug, we encourage each other. When we listen to each other, we partner. When we pray for each other, we partner. When we go to places like Kenya, we partner together. When we build things here, we partner together. Outreaches and potlucks and services of so many different kinds. It truly is a partnership in the gospel. And the gospel is a greater glue than any other thing that can hold us together. Right? Even our favorite football teams or our love for cats, anyone can, can hold us together. The gospel brings various people in various places who would never be together besides the gospel. One of the greatest compliments I've received about this church is like, <laughs> hey, let me tell you, this church is like got people from all over the place, right? From this side, that side, that color, that language, that educational background, that income back, 
ground level, all of these type of things that we're all together and we actually get along and like each other. Only God can do that. <laughs> and it's true, right? Come on, come on. That's right, you can clap for that. You can stand for that, right? Come on. Only God can do that. And so he binds us together. And Paul in verse 6, and a lot of people know this verse, right? Be confident of this. Confidence, what I'm talking about. Being confident in what? Your ability? No. Be confident of this, that he, who is the he here? God, this is Christ Jesus, that he who began a good work. He is the author of your faith, right? The author who began a good work in you will he will carry it out to completion until the day in which he comes back. Okay? That's good news, right? He is working in us. He is helping us. Now, we partner with each other, but we're also partnering with God, right? You are the body of Christ, right? He's the head, ultimately, spiritually speaking. And we are connected to him. And so he tells us what to do. And we have, check this out, the privilege of responding to him and actually doing the work that he's asked us to do. That's big time, y'all. And so God helps us to do that. And he extends his work through us. So he does that. In this case, specifically, the Philippians were partnering with Paul from the beginning. And he trusted that God would help them to continue it out. We partner with the Delameters. We partner with uh, tens and uh, I don't know how many, 30 missionaries, 40 missionaries. We partner with people and organizations, all these things. We partner with each other. It's an extension of God working. Let's continue to do that as we continue to grow in faith, being confident that God is working in us and through us. And you do not always feel like he's doing that. God, what are you doing? That's a good prayer, by the way. God, will you show me what you're doing with my life? Ask that. I believe God will show you things past tense. He will give you things present tense. And he knows that there's things to do future tense. There is zero unemployment in the kingdom of God. Right? Till you're 96 or seven, or eight, or a hundred, you have stuff and ways to give glory to God. This is a joy, and be confident that God is working in you, God is working through you. It is amazing. This last couple of weeks, we, um, we went to celebrate with our daughter who graduated from seminary, which was a great thing. And while we did that, we also toured the East Coast. One of the places that we went to is the Bible Museum. There is actually a place called the Bible Museum. Last Sunday, that's where we were, okay? And we spent most of the day doing that. It was remarkable. It was fascinating. I wanted to spend more time there. But the one room that moved me the most was a room about as big as this platform and it was yeah just like just like this kind of a um what do you call this oval wow dave okay geometry oval it was an oval so you walk into this and there's bookshelf on this side bookshelves all on this side so this whole thing was full of bookshelves and what they had was all of the known languages in the world represented on these shelves. And there was physical copies of the Bible, the scriptures in the language that was there on these bookshelves. Here's all the ones that we have. It's like, wow, that's pretty good. And then in these other places now where were placeholders that look like books, that this is the language of whatever it is. And they had it colored, saying these ones are all in progress. We're currently working on it right now. And then they had a section, like these ones, no one's working on, right? But we want to complete all of these languages so that every nation, every tongue, every tribe will be able to have the word of God in their heart language. I thought that was incredible, right? Now, no, no, no. 
There's partnership there. And all of these groups and agencies have come together. It's like, we are going to get this done. I want to be, if I'm still alive at the time, I want to be in that room when they put the last volume into place. <laughs> That's going to be a day, y'all. I'm glad we're partnering this way and partner with agencies, partner in places that are on the edge, right? On the fringe. Give some finances, give some time, give some prayer. There are ways in which the church works together to accomplish things that would not be accomplished if we did not join together, be it raking our neighbor's lawn to fulfilling the Great Commission. Paul is excited and knowing that he's confident that it will be completed. Next point. So be confident that God is working in you. God is working through you. Do that. And then thirdly, enjoyed the shared, enjoy the shared love of gospel community. Enjoy shared love of gospel community. Paul continues to write in verse 7. Now he says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, see that this is an extension of the partnership. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and into 14, but 12 in particular, uses the analogy of the body of Christ, describing the church. Okay? Now, we're all familiar with bodies because y'all got one, right? And if you don't got one, we got some problems, right? <laughs> y'all have a body. You understand how it works, right? You need your fingertips, right? You need your elbow to be working properly. You need your eyes, right? Your appendix is debatable. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I don't know where that came from. When one part hurts, it affects everything, right? When part's doing well, it affects everything. We're different, different callings, different shapings, different purposes so to speak. The lungs do what the lungs do. The heart does what the heart does. The fingertips, the eyelashes, they're all important. So they have a specific shaping and a specific connectivity that it works together. We work together. We need each other. And if you're doing well, we can rejoice. That's part of being a part of the body of Christ. We celebrate graduations, right? We celebrate accomplishments. We celebrate in overcoming various things. We partner together. And when we are suffering, we suffer together, right? It's a good Thing. It's bearing one another's burdens right? and rejoicing with each other's victories. The only way that you can do that is be connected to someone else. More than just sitting in a space together. It is carrying each other in our hearts. If I could go in and look at your heart, so to speak, metaphorically speaking, who's in there? Because you got people in there. Right? You better have your spouse in there if you're married. <laughs> Just saying. Kids, I'm sure. Grandkids are easiest to hear. <laughs> Don't know, yeah. But there's other people that you carry. Paul says, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you're not a ministry, you're not you're not a ministry I do things to. You're people that I do things with you in my heart. May God expand our hearts so that we can carry other people. 
to who are you carrying? Ask God to give you love more than just a name, more than just a common connection and a community of faith that you would know. And Paul will talk about that more. But there is enjoyment in the shared love of a gospel community. I like to hear when, when guys like Dave Wilson, who was a longtime temple guy, he stayed here. His wife died. He went to go live by, by his children, which I, I get. The one thing he says, like, I don't want to leave here because I love the people of this church. I love this church. And if God calls you somewhere else, I want you to feel a caring in your heart because you love the people that are here. Hopefully you're leaving when and if you leave, be it to heaven or God calls you some way, you're doing it with tears because you're invested in the lives of other people. Enjoy the shared love of gospel community. God, help us to do that. The next verses talk about how we can specifically do this. Grow your love, grow your love with or in knowledge and insight. So how can we enjoy the love of shared gospel community? Well, we grow in love through knowledge and insight. And we'll talk about specifically how we can do this. This is Philippians 1, 9, through the rest of our passage for this morning. Now, this is a wonderful prayer. Now, Paul introduces himself, says a lot of things already, and says, hey, 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 I'm going to pray for you, and this is how I pray for you, and this is profound, and this is my prayer, he says, that your love, Praying for our love, right? May abound, may grow. I'm praying that your love will grow more and more, abounding, being super abundant. How? In knowledge Hmm. and depth of insight. We're going to circle back to this. It's important. So that you may be able to discern, to know, to figure out what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, this is a remarkable prayer. If you pray, no, I'm going to say this, when you pray for our not my congregation, right? I don't own this place, right? I have the honor of serving here. When you pray for our church, pray this, right? Pray, God, will you help our love to grow more and more? Guess for who? Each other. Help us to love each other more and more. Well, how do we know if we do that? Well, we grow our love by knowledge, okay? Knowing things about other people. (laughs) Knowing, I'm glad you can know stuff like, you know stuff like, hey, these people like to play cribbage, right? Which I do too. These people like this type of car, or they like to eat this type of food. Grow in your knowledge of people. How do you do that? By asking questions, by spending time. I've known this guy for a very long time. We spent a lot of time together. I know a lot about Scott. How did that happen? Years. How did that happen? Intentionality. Coffee. Moving each other. Playing golf. Hanging out. Having conversations. I know a lot about Scott. Not only knowledge, but death depth of insight. I know what his strengths are. I know what his weaknesses are. I know what his loves are. I know where he wants to grow. I know a lot about his past. I know a lot about his hopes and dreams. This is what you get for sitting in the front row, okay? (laughs) Using it as an illustration. (laughs) Knowing, so having knowledge about Scott and how having growing in, man, I'm sweating, depth of insight helps me to catch the next part of the verse, to discern what is best. So I know how to pray for Scott. 
I know what to talk to Scott. I know what to give Scott for his birthday. Right? I know I've discerned what is best. Why? Because I love him. Well, how did that grow? With knowledge? Well, how did that grow? God, give me insight into the individual. So I want you to know more than just stuff about people, but know why. What makes them tick? What are their wounded places? And you all been wounded some way. It takes trust. It takes time. It takes vulnerability. It takes transparency. I want you to know people. I want you, when you think about Sunday morning, like, I can't wait to get to be with my friends. Ministry happens in this room, but it happens in the hallways, the parking lot, in homes, in our cafe, in our fellowship hall. May God help us to grow our love, that these aren't people that you just tolerate. (laughs) But this is the place of like, man, I love these people. Because I know these people. I understand these people. And that knowledge and that understanding and that depth gives me what I need to discern, to know what to do. What to do. What to say. Please have friends in this congregation. More than, yeah, I know when I go to church with them. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hang out with them. I don't got time. I don't have time either. Right? Make time. Make time. There's two things in this world that are eternal. The word of God and people. Invest yourself in things that matter that will last a long time. Right? right? Come on, thank you. Grow in your love and knowledge. You have a limited amount of time, right? Open your heart. Open your life. Open your wallet sometimes. Spend some money to hang out with people. Great investment. I'm, I'm serious, right? Open your home so that we will grow in your love. This is a prayer that we will abound more and more. So please Pray that for a congregation. And if we do this, we know what to do. We do this, we'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness, right? That people will know they are Christians because of what? Thank you. Our love that comes through Jesus Christ. And the ultimate goal is the glory and praise of God. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. That's our mission statement, by the way. This is what we're doing. We're growing, and we're going, and we're glorifying the Lord. This is a remarkable thing. So I'm going to pray for us. Right? And I hope that you have grabbed a hold of something. Remind yourself of something. I'm going to pause before I pray. I'm going to be quiet and imagine that for like 10 seconds. <laughs> that something will sink. Put it in to practice. And it might be of making a phone call. It might be having a more in-depth conversation. It might be being confident that God's working in you. It might be understanding your identity in Christ. It might be just living in grace and peace. I don't know what it is internalize it, believe it, receive it, enjoy it, live in it for the glory of God. So let's just pause. I'm going to pray, and then we'll continue with our closing song and benediction. Lord Jesus, thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for giving us a new identity which is holy in you. Thank you for peace, and God, will you extend the grace and this peace to 
every person here, and there's people here in turmoil. God, will you untie the knots of our soul, of our mind, our hearts, our bodies, God? Thank you for being with us. Do that here. God, I pray along with Paul, along with you, Holy Spirit, that we as a church in a specific place with specific leaders, God, Cross Point Church, that we, our love would abound more and more and more with one another and with you. God, that we grow in our knowledge, we grow in our depth of insight, both with you, both with each other. And that there would be great fruit of righteousness for your name's sake. Help us to be vulnerable. Help us to make space. God, expand our hearts. That we can carry each other because we are connected through the gospel. So do this work here, God. I can't do that. You must do it. Do it, Father, here for your glory and our benefit. Thank you for working among us. In Jesus' name, amen.